Welcome to Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse, a podcast exploring cult classics, subculture, and geek media. I'm Nick. And I'm Dave. And we will be your tour guides for this hot take of David Lowry's 2021 uh, chivalric romance, The Green Knight. I don't know if I would have genred it chivalric romance. That's there's, what it said at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, there's not a lot of romance. There's a whole lot of art film going on here. Well, what does romance mean? I guess maybe the rom- romanticizing something, the idea mm-hmm. of chivalry and honor. Yeah. It certainly wasn't like uh, romance regarding love. No, no, it is not. No, I wouldn't say that at all. It's not a, uh, a romantic film or a rom-com or yeah, there's no like calm that. in the whole movie <laughs> <laughs> well there's a couple laughs <laughs> some small chuckles sure so we just went to see this movie today and mm-hmm. we came immediately here to the pod cave right after watching it so we could have the hottest of takes i had not seen this movie in any way shape or form except for the trailer which i had uh stumbled across i don't even remember what it was before um i think inexplicably the trailer for this ran before fast nine because oh yeah i think we were in we were in the movie theater and i said i leaned over and i was like i really want to see this movie and you were definitely attracted to the trailer you thought it looked good yeah so i i saw the trailer i intentionally haven't uh ignored or i should say avoided uh online reviews and people's uh social media posts about it because it's been out for a few days Mm -hmm. and uh i wanted to go into this as a blank canvas yeah i did too i i had to really resist my urges because um usually if i know we're doing a podcast uh one of my go-to's is like Oh, this is based on a book. I'm gonna download that audiobook and listen to it. Yeah, and um, I held off. So yeah, because this is based on uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight by yeah. Anonymous. Yeah, it's a 14th century verse, right? Like it's a it's a poem. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's one of those those sufficiently old. Um, uh, manuscripts to where it it defies a modern convention mm-hmm. so but yeah you're right it's 14th century and um it was it was at the time considered a romance although that seems to be pretty strange to me <laughs> i just think it's a we have a different idea of what that word means than mm-hmm. than how in literary conventions how it's how it's used yeah so we're going to we're going to get into what exactly uh, what we thought about this movie, maybe try to go through it a little bit. I, I don't want to go scene by scene, but I definitely want to talk about some of the like the big more beats. interesting parts. There were definitely some things that happen in here, and because this is an uh, this is kind of an ancient story, much like if you watch Beowulf made into a movie or whatever, it's mm-hmm. gonna have a, 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 a sort of a cadence like this. And then this, yeah. and then this. And there's not a lot of twists. It's, no, it's, it's a, just uh, it's just one thing happens, then another thing happens, and so on. It's a fairy tale, yeah. right? It's something uh, sort of like I mean, it seems like the like almost like diminishing it to say it's like a bedtime story. But this is that sort of uh, like these are the stories, like you know how they uh, in Game of Thrones they always talk about. Santa liking her stories about knights and knights and maidens or whatever. Yeah, this is this one is, of those. Yeah, this is one of those stories for sure. So uh, it's uh, it seems like it's been a little bit since we recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you been up to? Oh man, I have been uh, seeing movies because I think we're in we're in summer movie season, so stuff's been coming out. Oh. So I've seen uh, a bunch of movies. I saw Snake Eyes. I saw oh, Black man. Widow. I saw any good. Uh, Snake Eyes. No, oh, this is a podcast, Nick. You yeah. can't just make a grimace. <laughs> I can't make a grimace. That's not good audio. <laughs> yeah. Depending on how generous you are, maybe Snake Eyes is a three star movie. Okay. Probably not. It's probably not. Um, it's entertaining enough. It's you know, there's a wor- worse ways to spend your time than watch that movie, but. N- there's a lot better ways. Okay. Too. Um, Black Widow and the Suicide Squad are both uh, much better ways to spend your time than than Snake Eyes. I've heard was. good things about the Suicide Squad. Yeah, you would. I think that one you would like. It's it's uh, 
much closer to like a Deadpool type movie where it's it's irreverent and over the top and do you uh, have to absurdly violent go to a theater or can you stream no it? that one you can just watch on hbo max okay that's you, the key we could go upstairs and watch it right now <laughs> <laughs> nice well i mean i haven't really been seeing any movies so i'm i'm glad to hear that there are at least a couple of decent ones out yeah so what have you been up to because you've been doing stuff yeah the reason why we took a bit of a big gap in recording was to make room for me to go on a trip a big long uh, road trip from here in the northwest down to Yellowstone National Park and the Grand Tetons we start we uh, we spent some time in Montana a bunch of time in Wyoming um, and I gotta say the hype is real uh-huh. uh, Yellowstone is legit um, Grand Tetons amazing when you're um, when you're going around in Yellowstone, it never lets you forget that it's uh, an active, uh, there's, there's active uh, volcanic activity happening all mm-hmm. around you. It's super beautiful. Um, and the wildlife there is amazing. The Grand Tetons, I almost like the Tetons better, not because it has something like, I mean, it's, it's really beautiful mountains, I, mm-hmm. but I'm from the Northwest. I spent a lot of time in my youth in the mountains, yeah. but these are different. They're these big kind of storybook ma- mountains mm-hmm. that are huge, craggy and sharp, but also the crowds are way less than in Yellowstone. Huh. Uh, interesting. The Grand, and the Grand Tetons Park is, uh, it's adjacent. You drive from one park to the other so and what state is that in wyoming that's in wyoming okay because mm-hmm. i have driven through wyoming on my way to colorado and at least the parts of wyoming i saw um were a whole lot of nothing i just saw flat flat land and fracking fields yeah western uh western wyoming is where the is where the mountains are they're the hmm. they're the place where you go to uh see the things okay well, cool. That sounds like a pretty cool trip. So uh, what is our podcast fuel for today? Well, we have something uh, sort of a little special because one of the divers actually brought this back from Hawaii for us. Uh, this is the, the Hanalei Island IPA. It came to us courtesy of diver Chris. I mean, we have three Chris's. Uh, we don't usually use last names. Chris W. Diver Chris W. Let's say that. All right. Um, she smuggled this back in a crawler from from Hawaii to us. Oh, that's risky business. Yeah, because it started leaking like as soon as I opened it. So very lucky it didn't go all over in her luggage. All right. Um, it's a session IPA, four point five ABV, forty IBUs, and it's pretty tasty. Yeah, I'm digging this. Um, I, I took one drink and I thought, wow, this is something I could definitely. Uh, I could drink a lot of, so it's good to hear it's a session. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, Kona doesn't get a lot of love because they're, they're, you know, similar to Widmere here, they're Craft Brewers Alliance Brewery, and maybe they're not craft beer, but... I don't know. I've had a lot of Kona beers, and generally, I'm I'm satisfied. Yeah, if you go to like a barbecue and you open the you open the cooler and you see a Kona, mm-hmm. you're like, okay, this is gonna be good. Yeah, it's, I go, yeah, longboard lager. How about it? Yeah, you're not gonna consider this to be one of these micros like we have in town or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's it's a little bigger than that, but still, I I think fondly of Kona. I'm I've always liked their beers. I've never had a bad one. I don't think. Mm-hmm. And I always like, because, uh, you know, it's served a lot when you go to Hawaii. So mm-hmm. it just puts you in that island mood when you drink it. That, yeah. That's why, part of why I like them, like you said, for barbecues and stuff. Cool. All right. So let's take a short break and then we'll come back and uh, give a hot take of the Green Knight. All right, welcome back, divers. Uh, let's get into this. What did you think? What are your first thoughts, Dave? Hot, your real hot take. My real hot take is this is not what I expected. Oh, okay. It was way more art house with a very unsatisfying ending. Oh, you wanted something a little more definitive. It, it, it is an ambiguous ending. Yeah, I wanted it to like end in some way. Like mm-hmm. it just sort of, it just sort of like, and then it's done. But we'll get there. Okay. Um, what about you? What was your hot take? 
Um, I've really been looking forward to this movie a lot, and I understand what you're saying, but I needed I need more movies like this in my diet, my my move my film diet. Well, you do keep a steady stream of trash coming mm-hmm. in. Yeah, with I your comic book movies. I consume a lot of pop cinema. <laughs> and I need to also get some of this crunchy cinema, like where it's like, what did that mean? And what, why, what's the significance of his uh, saffron colored cloak that he wears? Yeah. I, I, and it's like, there's a lot of symbolism and a lot of stuff to unpack. I, you know, I definitely, I'll be rewatching this movie. Yeah. I think that this is one that definitely bears a second watching. Mm -hmm. If you're going into this movie thinking it's going to be like an action adventure fantasy movie, it absolutely is not. Yeah. There's virtually no action. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's pretty much no action. It's just a drama. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, it's, it's really beautiful. That was one thing that really struck me is the way that it shot Mm -hmm. the camera work, the costumes, the sets. Um, they're all just so beautiful. It, this is a really, um, vivid looking movie. I'm not Mm -hmm. going to say it's the colors are bright, but everything is super saturated. Yeah. Um, and the, the crazy thing is that this movie was made for only $15 million. Interesting. Yeah, there's not a ton of like intense special effects. There's a there's a CGI fox, yeah, and there's some giants and certainly a, a titular green man. But I think he's mostly makeup. Yeah, mostly a guy. Yeah. Um. So there's not a lot of effects. It's a very kind of simple movie, and kind of to your point, like the way it's shot, especially in the beginning. There's these long uh, tracking shots just of giving you scenery and castles and kind of entering into the castle and it's all lit with uh you know i don't know what do you call like the a castle window but um it's lit naturally with sun, yeah, sunlight yeah. coming in through the windows and through candles and embrasures so it's very dark yeah it's it, the inside of the castle is really is really grim and uh it it gives you that feeling immediately that you're mm-hmm. in a, you're in like a historical place, and this this is you know sort of the like the dark ages. It's not like if you watch um, like a Knight's Tale mm-hmm. where every every scene is super well lit, even in the ca- uh, castles and everything like that. So, yeah, so it's, it's a that's a deliberately anachronistic movie, you know, to, down to the modern pop music. Yeah, stuff obviously. That's in it. Yeah, um, or this is is definitely going for uh i don't want to say like a traditional vibe because they do some you know what you might think non-traditional things like with like colorblind casting and stuff like that it's Mm -hmm. um it's not uh slavishly historical by any means it's (laughs) but it's um you have people who are who are supposedly siblings who mm-hmm. are of of different different ethnic- ethnicities. Yeah, so it's it's definitely a a fantasy in the fullest uh, like casting sense. Yeah, it, and that didn't take away from the story. In any oh, not way. at all. I think the actors did a good job, and I think I think that also I think there is a an underlying statement on Britishness in mm-hmm. the movie, like what it means to be a, a, a Brit. Huh. Uh, and I think that's part of the casting. Yeah. There, the, I mean, the, the lead in this movie was Dev Patel and he's, he's a really great actor. He's mm-hmm. been in a ton of things and he's uh, you know, award winning actor and he, he really does a great job in this movie. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. He's uh, I first probably with anyone else, like the first time I saw him was in the show skins which I guess was probably in the early 2000s when he's a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, he's, you know, he's grown up to be quite a quite an accomplished actor. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So let's kind of start this off. Like, it started off in, uh, they never call it that, but it's in Camelot. Mm-hmm. And um, he's essentially a, uh, he's a, He's allowed. Not a, he's yeah. not a knight. He's, he's not a knight. He's, he's the king's a, nephew. He, yeah, and he's in a brothel, and he's um, 
and he's with this lady who seems to be kind of a long-term paramour. Mm -hmm. Her name's Essel. And interestingly enough, she was the lady who played um, the artificial intelligence on Ex Machina. Oh, yeah. So Al I, Alicia Vikander. Yeah, I immediately recognized her from that. And I was like, okay, they got a really good actress in here. Yeah, she's awesome. And she, what else? She's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, they start off in that scene and, and it's kind of a, um, you know, one of those buffoonish scenes where he's getting up and trying mm -hmm. to leave and putting on his clothes and can't find his boots and all of that. And, um, yeah, he ends up going home and it turns out his mom is there and, uh, scolds him for being up all night and being drunk. Yeah. Basically he, he gets up. Uh, they go to they go to Christmas mass. It's Chris, Christmas morning yeah. when when he wakes up, and then he goes home and tells his mom that he's been at mass all night, and she accuses him of of been drinking the sacrament all night because he smells yeah. like booze. And it's like a it's an open secret. Uh, you know, his mother's a witch. This is Morgan Le Fay. Mm. That's that's uh, historically, or I should say fictionally in in the in the arthur arthurian mythos and more and so is that because i am not an expert on arthurian legend mm -hmm. at all is morgan Le Fay arthur's sister typically i i think it has changed over time in mm -hmm. different tellings um but in this case yes yeah i like how um i like when it portrays the sort of muddiness in Christian Europe about how things are not really fully Christian pagan they're pagan, all wearing pentacles yeah and the pagan like beliefs are still um very present like there's even a point there's like a, a priest is is blessing uh his shield and there's like a a Mary and Jesus on the inside of a shield, but the outside, the little hub thing on the outside of a shield has a pentacle on it. Yes. So it's like there's a real it's it's brackish water as far as like uh, faith practices at this period. Yeah, it's 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 pretty cool scenery in this in this um, in this town. They mm -hmm. they they did really good sets. So basically. Um, uh, Gawain then is, is wants to go to, uh, he wants to go to the party mm -hmm. at, that evening that, uh, the king is having and all the knights will be there cause yeah. he wants to be a knight. So, you know, you gotta be seen. Yeah. And, uh, his mom is like, nah, I'm not going to go. I don't yeah. feel up to it. She's got other plans. Yeah. She's got witching to do. <laughs> yeah. She's always hanging out with her little coven of witches. Um, up to things she's she's got plans for her son i think is is kind of what's going on mm -hmm. um you know at least that's my take on it is that she's the instigator of a lot of the events in the movie yeah she's she's behind a lot of the stuff and so basically he goes to this party and the party essentially sucks in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> it's boring well it's the they're just nights, right? Like they're just hanging out, drinking. They're just hanging out. Um, I don't know. It's pretty cool to look at the nights of the round table. Um, you know, you there's lots of different sort of takes on them. Usually, everything is much is sort of too clean and modern. Yeah. So yeah. kind of seeing uh, proper hard men as the knights of the round table merlin with like tattoos on his face yeah and... he's definitely like any had tattoo like runes tattooed on his on his fingers and stuff it yeah was pretty it was pretty cool and did you could you pick out any particular knights do you know enough that you'd be like oh not really that's I, lancelot i really want to um watch this again or mm -hmm. maybe some some nerdy website will do it will do a breakdown on it or oh, something I'm, I'm sure there's already a ton of youtube videos yeah so basically they're in this party and somebody busts in the door and rides the horse into <laughs> the middle and it is the green knight he's a dude with a with like a, a a green like a wooden face he's mm -hmm. it's a green man's face right. and he's got natural like like vines and stuff on him and he's wearing armor and on all of that and he has this big ass grim axe and mm -hmm. he says he wants to play a game and challenge any of these brave knights that any of them can that can land a blow on him they'll win his green axe mm -hmm. and then 
in a year, they have to bring it back to him and he gets to do an equal blow on them in return. Yeah. See, I think you got the the gist of the bargain pretty well. I don't think Gawain got it. No, he's like, uh, I didn't understand. It's like, oh, so if I can hurt you, I get the axe for a year and mm-hmm. then you hurt me back. Basically, that's what he said. However, whatever blow you, blow you land on me, whether it's a, a nick or a slash, I'll revisit on you the same. Yeah. It seems very cut and dry, right? This is a, a kind of a typical sort of like wizard bargain or, or you know, like any sort of magical bargain. Um, but Gawain is a, is a hothead wanting to prove himself. Yeah, and, and I think Gawain... Th- believes that there will be a fight like he's gonna get to prove how good he is like yeah i'm gonna be the one that lands the blow Mm -hmm. because i'm good and so he can prove how you know he's done something heroic because earlier his his uh, uncle is you know asking him tell me a tale of yourself and he's Mm -hmm. like i don't have any there have there aren't any tales and they're like yet there aren't any tales yet yeah uh the queen says that to him yeah um and yeah, Liza, Liza Tully showing up as Queen Vin- Guinevere. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty cool. Um, it all through this movie, everyone is trying to get him to make good decisions. Mm-hmm. Like literally, every person he talks to, kind of tries to steer him the right way, and he always makes the wrong call. Pretty much through the whole film. Yeah, and so like the the Green Knight makes the challenge, mm-hmm. and the king is like. Um, I I would fly across this table and strike you myself, but my body will not do it. And he asks if any of his knights will comply, and all of them are just kind of looking around, like, I don't want any of this business. This yeah. is this is Witchcraft. this is tomfoolery. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, young Buck Gawain is like, I'll do it, and he jumps into the middle. And he's like, I need a sword. And nobody will give him a sword. So he gets uh, his uncle hands him Excalibur. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like one of those like, it's none of this stuff is stated, right? Yeah. And, they don't say, here's Excalibur. I'm King Arthur. They uh-huh. never say that. Yeah. It's like the, the lady of the lake rose it aloft and I took it from her hand. No, it's. It's all implied when Arthur pulls out the sword and like the the moonlight shines on it. It's like, oh shit, that's the sword. Yeah, the titular sword in the stone. <laughs> and so he's squaring off against Green Knight, and the Green Knight, uh, and he's all in a fighting stance. And then the Green Knight kneels and says, "Strike me." Mm-hmm. And then he turns his head, like, "Cut off my head. I don't care." He's and and going. You know, he hesitates. He's like, ah, I don't know about this. And then finally, he's like, you made the challenge, and I will accept the challenge now. Mm-hmm. And so he turns, and he he cuts off the Green Knight's head right in front of everyone. And, you know, maybe Gawain was thinking, if I cut this fool's head off, he's dead, mm-hmm. and I get the axe, and I never have to go there in a year because the guy's dead. Like, if he's not thinking with fairy tale logic, he's just thinking, this guy's done, story over, I beat the Green Knight in a duel, and mm-hmm. I have the Green Axe. Yeah, it doesn't go that way. The The Green Knight stands up, picks up his head, and does a, a sleepy hollow out of there laughing. Yeah, carrying his head in his hand, a mm-hmm. headless horseman rides through town, and... um. I mean, it was really cool imagery. Oh, for sure. Um, and so that is basically um, that's how the that's the whole premise of the movie. The entire thing is mm-hmm. Gawain takes up uh, a stupid boast <laughs> and then has a year before he has to go and travel to the Green Chapel to meet with the Green Knight. Mm-hmm. And so a year passes. They don't they don't do anything in the year. They just say. A year passes. Yeah, so too short a year or something yeah. like that. Because, uh, yeah, when it's, you know, you're going to get beheaded at the end of it, a year is a pr- uh, not a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And we come back. Gwen hasn't done much in that time. He's, he's still hanging around the brothel. He's still kind of just, uh, what, a roustabout? What do you, what yeah, do you call he, him? Yeah, he's just a man of leisure. He's he's just doing doing what what king's nephews do mm-hmm. in town uh spending gold living large yeah 
and then he's t- it's time to go everybody knows it's time to go uh and so they they like armor him and bless him excuse me and um get everybody and mm-hmm. and they all support him to send him off and his mother makes him this enchanted belt yeah and she sews she carves a rune stone and sews it into the belt and mm-hmm. tells him if he as long as he wears this uh nothing can hurt him yes um and you know he goes out a questing after this gets you know gets sent off by king arthur and everyone is sort of rooting for him and has good advice for him yeah and he goes wandering out and he he doesn't get all that far before he gets uh robbed by kids yeah <laughs> so basically like this this journey to the green chapel is just a series of inf- of unfortunate events that mm-hmm. happen and the first one is that he just gets duped by a young kid to go up into the woods where there are more armed people and Mm -hmm. Gawain's not like an excellent knight. He's not a good fighter. He just gets, he just gets robbed. They take all his stuff, Mm -hmm. the, the green ax, his sword, his horse. They left the sword sword on the ground. They broke his shield. I don't know why they left the sword on the ground. I think because, um, the sort of ringleader takes off with the ax and rides off on his horse. Yeah. And the friends that had been playing with the sword drop it to and chase, chase him. him. Yeah. yeah. And they just forget about it. Yeah. And so Gawain cuts himself loose with mm-hmm. the sword that's on the ground. He 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 he, he like crawls up to it and cuts his hand and gets mm-hmm. himself free. But then he's he's running through the woods mm-hmm. and he leaves the sword on the ground too. I thought that too. He doesn't not pick the he yeah. get, he gets his cloak and gets like what what's left of his clothes and stuff, but he also leaves the sword. Mm-hmm. Um, and he doesn't have his belt anymore. The kid stole the kid it. took the belt. Yeah, the magical belt. So he doesn't have his magic axe or his magic belt or his horse or his horse. Arguably, the horse is the most is the biggest <laughs> loss. <laughs> and so he just keeps he keeps just going mm-hmm. forward. And what does he encounter next? Um, the next one is he is, I think he encounters the fox and the fox, does the fox lead him to the cabin? I think he sees the fox at Mm -hmm. this point, but then he makes his way to the... (sighs) To the cabin where he, it's like this abandoned cottage Mm -hmm. and he's looking around and there's nobody there. And so he goes to sleep in the bed Yeah, because he's totally uh, tuckered out. And he gets woken up in the night by uh, Infant's Nest from Solo. Yeah. Or what's her name in Falcon and Winter Soldier? Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. Redhead girl. Yeah. (laughs) Random. Yeah. The terrorist lady um, who's a super soldier. Mm -hmm. But in this case, she's a young lady who's kind of wearing a nightgown and asking him, why are you sleeping in my bed? She introduces herself. Her name's Winifred. And um, she she asks him a favor. She asks if uh, he will go out into the pond and deep and dive into it and get her get head. her head yes because she is a, a ghost yeah she's a ghost she got murdered by somebody um and the person cut off her head and threw it in the in the pond he asks just completely shit bird like <laughs> what are you gonna pay me and she's like why would you even ask me that Yes, it's it's one of many times where he's being taught lessons on chivalry. It's like um, on everyone is trying to encourage him to behave like an honorable knight. Yeah. Like when he kind of thinks that she's a ghost, he reaches out to touch her and she's like, don't touch me. A knight should know better. Yeah. Like and when you like you said, he says, will you give me in return if I if I get your head? And she's like, why would you ask me that? Like act like a knight yeah. you're on a knight everyone knows he's on a quest dress for the job you want uh-huh. act like a knight if you want to be a knight act like a knight but he does knight up and and dive in with his his boots on that was dumb yeah he didn't take off any of his clothes <laughs> or anything he dives to the bottom and he finds a a, a gnarly old skull and yeah. he flies and he he swims up 
He goes into the house, Mm -hmm. and there in the bed that he was sleeping in is, or maybe it's a different bed. I think think it's it's the same same bed. It's the same bed. There is a skeleton of Mm -hmm. a lady, and he places the skull where, you know, it would go because it had no head. And then he turns, and as he's about to leave, he sees his axe leaning against the the timber. Yeah. Well, and the the head talks to him, too. Oh, that's true. it, it 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 does. Like, when he gets in there with her head... Um, and she was like, now I can see thee because, uh, cause earlier she didn't know for sure that he wasn't the same Lord that had killed her. Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't know the rules of being this kind of ghost. You, the head needs to be there for her to be able to see. Yeah. So he does the right thing by the ghost. It's, mm-hmm. it's a simplistic scene as we describe it. Yeah. But ultimately I think it was pretty, it was creepy at first yeah. and then it was, it was, um, it was ultimately fairly redeeming for Gawain. Yeah, and that's Aaron Kellyman. I finally got that name, the actress. Um, and the thing, the big change that happens from here on out is he has the fox familiar with him for the rest of the rest of the adventure. Yeah. So the fox leads him. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he he's following this fox, and they're going da- through the wilderness, and eventually they kind of come across uh, like a ridge, and they see mm-hmm. these. Um, giants in the distance like walking yeah and he like calls out to them uh, calls out to one tries yeah. to catch a ride yeah he says you know where are you going it might might i travel across the valley on thy shoulder and then the giant um i, I don't know if she was trying to pick him up or if she was going to squish him but the fox defends him yeah and, and howls and and then the giants all howl um did you make the connection because i feel like the fox and saint winifred are related like the fox Hmm. she has red hair the fox is red and the fox kind of is always leading him to the things like i kind of felt like it was her her spirit guiding him yeah i i kind of thought that but then later on the fox does stuff that doesn't make me think that i don't know it doesn't speak in her voice when it does yeah, speak it, not to get ahead of ourselves yeah it does talk and it doesn't speak in her voice um i don't know i i, I honestly don't and i know we're just kind of talking about these um in, encounters mm-hmm. uh but it's worth noting the setting here this is a dude who it's it's raining, it's damp, it's dark. He's on foot. He's starving. Mm-hmm. He's uh, He's got no food. He's got no supplies. He never has what he needs to build a fire. Mm-hmm. He tries to strike stones together. It doesn't work. He is on a miserable journey. Yeah. It is just, this is just a terrible place, mm-hmm. uh, a land that he's crossing. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, he happens upon uh, a really bad, beautiful uh castle oh you you skipped over i think a big turning point in the movie what's that that's when he um eats the mushrooms oh yeah i guess i did i didn't i didn't feel like it was as big of a turning point as you did i guess yeah so every because everything changes after that scene i guess were the mushrooms before the giants even or is it right after it's around the same time yeah um I kind of already felt like there was a bunch of supernatural before the mushrooms yeah. with the fox and the ghost and all of that. Yeah, but the in the after the mushroom, because he, you know, like you said, he's freezing and starving. and In, he, in he, a cave, he gra- just grabs some rando mushrooms and eats them. Mm-hmm. Tosses some to the fox. Fox gobbles them up, too. And then he quickly yaks that up. Um, and then he, he sees the skin crawlies and stuff. He starts having hallucinations. Mm-hmm. And then after that, there's one of those, you know, 180 uh, clockwise camera turns where the whole frame flips upside down. Yes. So that's a, that to me, that's the, the rules of the game have changed moment in the movie. Because after that, that's when he comes upon the castle. And the, the, when we first see him, the guy has a bear head. Yeah, he's the Lord. Yeah, he's just called the Lord and and he goes and these people uh he he goes into this house and there's the Lord, mm-hmm. um the Lord's wife and an old blindfolded woman. Yeah. And they're 
they basically host him and they clean him up and they they try to help him out and they tell him he's only a day away from the green chapel yeah um it's joel joel edgerton is playing the lord and alicia vikander is playing or vikander is playing the lady yeah, so that was the first I think thing it's I noticed. intentional. It's supposed to be like Essel from the from his uh, home. Yeah, because everything, you know, in a in this sort of like fairy tale logic, at this point, everything is trying to get him to somehow mess up the quest. Mm-hmm. So I feel like they're misleading him as far as how long it's going to take. You know, how long he can stay. Like they're kind of trying to get him to be too comfortable there. there at least that was my my take on it it's he's supposed to be resisting temptations which he doesn't do a great job of doing yeah he's a he gives into temptations pretty easily yeah yeah so it seems pretty clear that the lord goes out hunting every single day Mm -hmm. and the lady of the house is trying to seduce him yeah um so the first you know when you show up, when you're on a magical quest and you show up and you see uh, a lady that has your girlfriend's face yeah. <laughs> and then she goes right for your little your little trinket that your girlfriend gave you and, and is sort of like, why do you wear this? Is it for love? And he goes, uh, no. no. And then she takes it right off of him. Yeah. And it's like, oh, man. Once again, another fail. You do. She should have said, yes, it was for love. Mm-hmm. But no, he's like, well, you know, I'm on a quest and I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to make it back. We call this geographic bachelorhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's kind of a scumbag at this point. Bad job, Gwen. And so he, the, the Lord exchanges a promise with him mm-hmm. at, where the, they will give each other gifts uh of what they've uh, what he's received or or something like that he's gonna go hunting and he's going to bring back the best of whatever he finds in the wood he'll bring it back and give it to Gwen, and Gwen should give to him anything that he is given while he's in or get he receives while he's in the house yes um and you know for whatever reason still not quite getting how magic bargains work uh Gwen agrees to this um and he gets given uh, a, a repeat, he gets back his magic belt basically yeah she the 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 lady gives him his magic belt but says this is something that she wove herself mm-hmm. and it's a whole psychosexual thing where she's tempting him mm-hmm. and he 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 said he try you know he does all right as far as resisting <laughs> but uh there is a, a sort of, a, I don't know, a, what do you what do you call it? A, a off camera hand job, like it was it. Yeah, we'll say that uh, some sort of uh, interaction occurred, and mm-hmm. Gawain makes a mess all over his new belt. Yeah, and <laughs> she tells him, "You're no knight." Yeah, <laughs> she basically, she basically uh, does the dirty with him, and then says. No, you're a bad guy. Yeah. You weren't you, supposed to You do were that. supposed to say no to that. <laughs> and, um, I mean, because he's being tested and tempted this whole time. Mm-hmm. And, and then, and so he's basically like... I'm out of here. Okay, fuck this place. <laughs> he puts on his magic belt. He puts on his cloak and all that and grabs his magic axe and just runs off into the woods. Yeah. And the Lord catches him before he gets too far and is like, what about our game? Um, and Gwen's like, nah, I don't want to play the game. No. Let's forget it. And, you know, it's, again, so the Lord uh, says, you know, that I had this thing for you. And he brings up a bag and he's got the the magic fox in the bag. In the bag, yeah. And because the Lord is not a bad guy, the Lord lets the the fox go. But if Gwen had done the knightly thing and given him the belt, then he would have been rewarded with the fox and it should have been a good lesson on honor for him yeah. but again he failed like everyone is trying to make him be better and he's just not doing a great job at it and and the lord is basically like so what did you what did you gain while you were in my castle because mm-hmm. now you have to give it to me yeah it's like, and he's like nothing yeah <laughs> forget the game let's part let's part each other yeah oh bad Gwen. Bad. <laughs> yeah. So, th- so the Lord, the Lord gives him a kiss, and it's essentially symbolic. Mm-hmm. 
And he, Gawain does not give the Lord the girdle because nope. he's supposed to give him stuff that he gets. Yeah, he's going to keep it because he doesn't want to get his head cut off. Yeah, and, it's his invulnerability belt. Yeah, and he's thinking, if I wear this, um, I'm not going to get my head cut off. I can go there uh, like a baller and the axe will just bounce off of me, basically, is his thought process. So yeah. he's not going to give it up. So basically, he runs away. He mm-hmm. parts with the Lord. He gets to a stream where there's a boat. And for the first time, the fox jumps out in front of him, turns and growls at him, mm-hmm. and then starts speaking in a human voice and says that he needs to abandon the quest. He needs to just not do this. This is a bad idea. And that's the one the one thing that Gwen does well is that he always pushes on. Every time he's given the opportunity to turn around and go home, he does at least press onward to mm-hmm. continue the quest. Yeah, he, he refuses the, the the fox. He says, I didn't want you anyway. Mm-hmm. I never asked for your company. And, and it's, it's very, I got, um, it's always kind of silly when you, you compare things that are more modern, but it's very much Yoda before uh, Luke goes down into the cave mm-hmm. and has to face himself. And Yoda tells him, don't bring your weapons. You won't need them. And the fox tells him the same thing. Don't wear the belt. You won't need it. But he doesn't give up the belt there. He's like, I think I do need it. Yeah. And so he gets in the boat. He paddles his own canoe. He gets down to... Um, <laughs> Shouts Nick Offerman. Yes. he get, he, And he gets to the Green Chapel mm-hmm. where the Green Knight is there in... Uh, like on a dais, I guess. Mm-hmm. But he's like in hibernation. He's, yeah, he's not like yet Christmas. inanimate. Yeah. And I love, um, I love this one of these, it, it's all through the movies, the juxtaposition of the pagan iconography and the Christian iconography. Mm-hmm. Because like you said earlier, the green knight is the green man. Um, but he's been absorbed into Christian mythology at this point and become a knight instead of like a druidic thing. And he's residing in a, a chapel instead of like a, I don't know, like a barrel mound or, or what sort of thing yeah. would be traditional to the old, the older ways. And I just really like that sort of imagery. Yeah, I thought it was really cool too. The Green Knight is one of my favorite um like visuals from this movie. I mm-hmm. think the costume and the practical effects and all of that were really cool. Yeah, and we should say you have a giant green man tattoo. Oh yeah, yeah. Like the t- t- divers may not arm. know this. Like on my right arm, <laughs> along along the back side of it, basically mm-hmm. from my wrist all the way up past my tricep, is a green man tattoo that I've had for like twenty years or something. Yeah. Um. So obviously, I really like that iconography. <laughs> Um, so I, I thought that was really cool. Um, and then of course, Gawain decides to take a nap. He puts the, he puts the ax on the steps and then he sleeps through the night cause the next day is Christmas. Yeah. And you know, it's sort of like at midnight, the night, the green night's eyes open mm-hmm. and, but he doesn't like fully wake up until like the sun is up and yeah, then he gets up dawn. and he goes, uh, to give Gawain the chop and, Gwen keeps uh, flinching or chickening out, and he's trying really hard to to steal himself. Um, but then ultimately, he cheeses it out of there. He runs off and goes back home. Uh, his horse is waiting for him outside, and he he rides and rides, and goes back home. Yeah, and so this kind of uh, it, it kind of goes really fast. Mm-hmm. It, it goes through. It's almost like a, a like a montage yeah. of the rest of Gwen's life after this. It definitely, Every, yeah, it goes into a montage. It, yeah, he, he ends up getting married to some uh, fancy noble lady. His, his, uh, Essel, his, his, uh, his, uh, lowborn lady has a son who they take away from her. Mm-hmm. He raises the son. Um, and the later they go to war, the yeah. son dies well, in battle. And Arth- Arthur, Arthur, passes oh yes and Gawain so Gwen becomes king, the king yeah he's the heir he's the only male uh relative mm-hmm. of the king being his nephew he so his his uh Gawain's son 
goes to war with him and mm-hmm. now an adult he dies in battle Gawain um so that was so becomes that a was, reviled king that was one i wasn't 100 sure 100 sure that that was supposed to be his son um but I thought that, but it yeah, just wasn't because because sure. there's no dialogue through that whole sequence. The kid, the guy was wearing a circlet, yeah, and then Gawain takes the circlet away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you, I think you're correct, but I kind of want a confirmation. <laughs> yeah, and and so then he comes back, and people throw mud at him, and he he goes it's poop. Was it poop? I'm I gonna, think it's I'm going to call it mud. <laughs> <laughs> He goes into his castle and, and you know, fast forward montage style, mm-hmm. they're under siege. They're being yeah. attacked. Him and his family, him and his wife are sitting in the in the throne room waiting. And, yeah. um, and then his wife and daughter and his mother all leave and just yes, leave him in new, the throne. His new wife has a baby. It's yeah. a little girl. Leaves him in the throne room by by himself. Mm-hmm. Um and the whatever the other army is literally beating down the door, and then he reaches into like a like a stigmata wound on his on his belly yeah. and pulls out the green belt. Yeah, like it's like it's his. He's pulling out his guts, but mm-hmm. it's the it's the magical sash. Yeah, and then his head falls. Off. Yeah. So and then cut back to the moment in the green chapel mm-hmm. when Gawain is kneeling on the ground in front of the green knight. Yeah, so my take uh is he he saw what happens he if saw he, the future. If he doesn't if he doesn't fulfill his uh fulfill his bargain with the green knight. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't fulfill it, he gets sort of everything he wants, but it's cursed. Right, like he becomes king and he has all this stuff, but you know, it all turns to ash in his mouth, sort of. Like it's, he doesn't, he's not going to have a great future, even if it's a long life getting everything that he thinks it that he deserves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's going to be a long life, but it won't be a fulfilling one, right? Because he didn't do the right thing, and so finally, he realizes what he needs to do, takes off the belt, and is ready for the knight to, to chop his head off. Yeah. And the green knight says, all right, off with your head. And mm, that's not all he says though. He says, um, God, what does he, what does he say? He doesn't say I'm proud of you. He says that you did the right thing. Yeah. It, it's very clear that the green knight approves of this course of action. Like, mm-hmm. okay, you actually are finally living up to the honor mm-hmm. of being Sir Gawain. Yeah. And it's, it's, is that, you know, he doesn't uh, tap him with his, he his axe he or whatever. He doesn't dub him. Yeah, but he, like, he does sort of, like, a blessing, you know, and, and, and taps his shoulder. And I think, like, that's the moment that he becomes Sir Gawain, the golden-hearted. Or, I think that's his title, right, yeah, in mythology? I don't, I don't know, yeah. honestly. But then he dies. So there you no, go. You think so? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I mean, I don't think he actually dies at that point. But um, we don't know because the movie That's ends. That's where the movie ends. Right there. Like after the Green Knight says, off with your head, it then literally just cuts and the mm-hmm. movie's over. That's true. You don't know what happens. You don't know what happens. It just goes, I guess um, we can look to mythology to know what happens. Okay. We can, um, you know. Well, there's just... a post credit scene mm-hmm. where there's a little girl in the throne room mm-hmm. and she is playing around and she puts on Arthur's crown. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the same girl. I don't know either. I think my take on it would be, um, that that is his daughter. I don't think that's the same daughter that we saw in his, in his vision though. Mm-hmm. Um, although, I mean, we don't, we don't know that. Um, but, I think the important detail there is that um, his head isn't in the crown. That's you, true. You know what I mean? Because like in his vision, his head falls off, uh, and in his vision, the daughter is older. And um, yeah, this girl's a toddler, whereas yeah. his other, uh, the daughter in the vision was maybe seven or eight. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, it is up to the audience to decide these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we are to infer that that is his daughter and that he became king. Sure. I like to think that he died a night on that day. 
you think the green the green man does it, I approve and then still cut off his head? Yeah, I think that's where I go with it. I you know yeah, it's, it's I a mean, die right. <laughs> go to Valhalla. <laughs> okay, wrong mythos. Yeah, no, I think they've they've abandoned that. <laughs> <laughs> well, inter- I mean that's the kind of movie this is though. Is it is up to the viewer, and I think this is gonna. It's one of those things where it's a a bit like is Deckard a replicant? Um, mm-hmm. You can argue about that. Um, pretty much forever. I mean, I think he was, but it's still debated in yeah, some it's circles. Definitely a debatable. Fact. Harrison Ford doesn't think he was. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, arguably he should know. But would you? Know, I don't think he he knew he was a replicant. I think that's the yeah, whole that's, deal. That's the deal with replicants. They yeah. don't really know. That's. Let's not get too caught up in Blade Runner. Or maybe we get caught up in Blade Runner, <laughs> but in another episode, definitely. <laughs> um, so, what did you think? What's your what's your hot take? I don't know if you're ready to do the rating. Uh, are we? I, I'm good with doing. I, I mean, do we want to do what worked for you and what didn't work for you first, and then our yeah, ratings? let's do that. All right. So, what worked for you? What were your personal highlights? Um, just this is a just a visually delicious movie. Mm. Like it is so um so good to look at. It's pretty slow and, and it's a bit long. It's uh, two hours and ten minutes, I think. Yeah. Um, but I never got tired of, of looking at it and, uh, you know, digesting what I was looking at, like kind of looking for the, the visual elements and the symbolism and trying to parse out what it was telling me. Um, so I love that. Um, I mean, do we include costumes in that as, because the costuming in this movie is great. Yeah. It's not extremely... Um, they're not trying for 14th century historic authentic. Mm-hmm. They're just trying for really good yeah. uh, fantasy costuming. And I think they fully accomplished yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and Dev Patel is like, uh, he's really, he has to carry this whole movie. And mm-hmm. um, he's great. He's so good. He's such, um, not quite a scoundrel, but a cad. I think I didn't yeah, say he's cad. definitely a cad. Yeah, he's definitely a cad, and like that wants to be something better, um, but can't quite bring himself there until the end. Yeah, he wants to be a knight, but he at that point doesn't understand what it means to be a knight. Yeah, he never can explain it when people ask him that, like you know, what do you want and what, what does honor mean and that stuff? He never really has an answer for, for those questions. And the Lord um, even says that. He's like, you're not very good at questions. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I really, every, everyone everyone in this movie is uh, acting their asses off mm-hmm. and it's just beautiful to look at. So I think that's the the main thing. And I enjoy, um, I enjoy the ambiguity of it. Oh. I, I like... Uh, to kind of come out uh, with questions and not having uh, had the whole thing like spoon fed to me. I have to make up my own decisions. Interesting. What about you? What worked for you? I mean, similarly, I really liked the the costumes and the v- sets and the visuals. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was an amazing uh, movie to look at. I mm-hmm. think that never was there a scene where you're looking at it and you, and, and there aren't many things to consider Mm -hmm. like even the scenes in the town or the castle you can look around and Mm -hmm. consider how they chose to use natural lighting Mm -hmm. or how they you know the different the way the different people are costumed all the way down to like when the when the scavenger guy who's a thief when uh you look at that guy's costume it was excellent it was Mm -hmm. really well thought out and he's a side character yeah he had some like scavenged armor that he had he'd taken off of corpses and and some like rings and valuables tied Mm -hmm. on a necklace around his neck kind of a choker yeah it was really cool so i think this this movie looked really good in in all of those ways and i think uh, the acting was really good. I mm-hmm. think that um, Dev Patel did a, an amazing job, and Alicia Vikander was another standout character for me. I think that those two um, those two actors did an amazing uh, job in this movie. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what didn't work for you? I don't know. I if I say I would have. Uh, 
liked a more uh, satisfying conclusion, it will be like I am uh, going back on what I just said a second ago. But I think, you know, to the point you were making earlier, it doesn't have a conclusion like beyond he made the right choice, but we don't know what happened to him. And that does leave you with a sense of frustration. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I'm of two minds on that, but I did have that sense of frustration where, but what happened, you know, and then the, the post credits doesn't really clear it up. The post credits is just as ambiguous as the, before the credits. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if anything didn't work, that's what didn't work. What about for you? So I had... I, I guess, so f- if I'm judging it for what it is, mm-hmm. I guess I would say that I didn't, tr- I didn't really enjoy how they, they put up text on the screen with, during each like scene change, mm-hmm. uh, almost like it was a play. Um, yeah. And, and I didn't, I mean, it was kind of making it into chapters of a book and that's okay. But I, I didn't love that. I also didn't like how the end was unsatisfying, mm-hmm. how, um, we didn't actually get to see, um, get to see what happens. But I, I guess that would be judging it on what it was, but what I wanted it to be, it was not. Mm-hmm. I wanted it to be a lot more of an action or an adventure movie where Gawain actually has some fairly redeeming qualities like mm-hmm. i would have liked him to engage in sword play with somebody yeah once like never does he do anything nightly in the physical sense no um he literally gets beat up by three kids yeah like they seem they seem like they're like 15 years old probably yeah and he's like armed and armored he should have been able to take him and out. on a horse <laughs> yeah. so i wanted i wanted him to be at least somewhat more heroic than he was mm-hmm. um and i wanted this movie to be a little more um i don't know like a little more heavy i like if adventure um, or like if if the if the green knight was a little more present in the movie huh um because he's not uh, into, except for in the beginning and the end. Right. I don't know. It just wasn't stylistically how I would have preferred. But of course, I wasn't the I wasn't the director or the writer. Um, and so for what it was, I think um, my main my main complaint was was how it ended and mm-hmm. how they did a bunch of literary style chapter changes in the middle of the movie. I just yeah. think it was ham fisted and unnecessary. Interesting. I well, I mean, so we describe this to the to the divers. Although hopefully, if you listen to this, you've seen the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the there's sort of like title cards or scene scene cards, and they're done in the in the style of like an illuminated manuscript, manuscript yeah. of the time. So it's it's just about um, you know having that vibe that that uh, poetic verse vibe to it, um, but. That's fair if that if you don't like those things. I, I think that's a fair observation. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. what a, what's your rating? What is my rating? This is a tough one mm-hmm. because um it's it's uh, it's it's utterly beautiful. Like mm-hmm. the movie is visually stunning and the the acting was excellent. Um and this is an art movie and I don't generally like art movies. Mm. Um, it doesn't, they don't leave me feeling satisfied. They leave me feeling like, ah, (laughs) um, like disquiet. Yeah. So I don't generally love those movies. So if I'm, if I'm rating it on the, 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 how much Dave liked it meter, Mm -hmm. that's one score. But if I'm rating it on how good was it for its genre, for what Mm -hmm. the artistic intention was, that's another rating altogether. Right. So I guess I'm not here to make all of my ratings just be my opinions on things, even Mm -hmm. though some of, you know, there's going to be a little bit of that. Right. I'm going to try to keep it more to how good was this movie. And I actually think this movie was excellent. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give it four stars. Hmm. I think I'm there with you at a four. Um, I really, uh, I've had it in my head uh, 
kind of like for the last two weeks that this was going to be a five. That was going to be my first five. And I don't, I don't quite feel like it. I it, wanted this to be a five star movie. Yeah. When, when we were driving to the theater, I, or, uh, I thought to myself, man, I hope this is a five star movie. This is going to be great. Yeah. I just don't think it's, it's quite there. And, um, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I feel, I guess I, I would have liked a more satisfying conclusion, but I feel conflicted uh, just about that, that issue, whether it's fair to penalize it for it. I, I mean, um, but I was, just think it was really slow. It was not, it, the plot was hyper linear. Mm -hmm. It was, I mean, they're worth a lot of things in this movie that were to be desired. If, if it was a five, I don't think there'd be any question. Yeah. And so ultimately that's why I'm falling on the four. Yeah. It, because I think it would be obvious. Um, so yes, four stars. Great. So let's go ahead and uh, take a break and then we'll come back with our finishing segment. All right, welcome back, divers. It's time for us to get into our final segment, the one where I ask Dave, what are you into right now? Well, like I said before, I had a long trip where we mm -hmm. did a ton of driving, and there were also some times where we were just chilling out during the heat of the day or whatever, mm -hmm. and so I had a bunch of audiobooks on my phone ready nice. to go. So as previously mentioned in this podcast, I listened to... Paddle Your Own Canoe. Oh. <laughs> uh, Nick Offerman's autobiography. And I listened to multiple uh, audiobooks, but this was the one that I was trying to find excuses to listen to. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I was going to it and I powered through it. Um, you know, it's over 10 hours of listening and I powered mm -hmm. through it in just a few days. So it was really great. So this is an autobiography by actor uh, Nick Offerman. And it's narrated by him, mm -hmm. so he has some nice little asides in there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting. Um, he's he's an interesting guy, and if you don't know who he is, he's the guy who plays Ron Swanson on Parks and Recreation. That's mm -hmm. kind of his most famous role. Mm -hmm. And um, that role was written specifically for him. Yeah. So there are tons of similarities between him and Ron Swanson, but there are also tons of differences because yeah. the character is intensely exaggerated. Right. Um, and so he's a Midwestern guy who uh, comes from the Iowa um, farms and mm -hmm. he, he grew up being like an athlete and a farmer and he ended up getting into theater in mm -hmm. high school and went to theater in college. And then he got into the Chicago um, uh, theater scene. So basically, mm -hmm. he's through and through a stage actor. Right. And um, he eventually moved to L.A. and broke into TV and film. Mm -hmm. And this book is filled with um, stories about his life um, where he tells, tells the stories and talks about the lessons. And he's got all sorts of folksy wisdom that he gives <laughs> out. So that and, and in his own words, he says, so that you can live a delicious life. Yeah. And he's he's really uh, he, his style of um, pragmatic charm really resonates with me. And it will not resonate with everybody. I understand that right. because he is the type of guy to say, pick yourself up dust yourself off, try it again. Mm -hmm. He's not the type of guy who is going to be, uh, he's not going to condemn you for giving up, but he's, he is the type of guy that has kind of that old school grit mentality. Right. Because he grew up on a farm and those were his role models, his old school gritty farmers, um, his dad and his uncles. And even, uh, yeah, so the, dif the different people in his life. So um, I, I, get, I can really get behind that. And then after I read or listened to this, I was looking for more. He has a bunch, he has a several more audiobooks, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to do one that's a little bit different. So I picked up um, 
a special called All Rise. It's about two hours, and this is one of his um, uh, live performances where he does tours and does like spoken word stuff, mm-hmm. kind of like Henry Rollins or any of these other guys. He he- hesitates to call himself a stand up comedian, he more calls himself a humorist. Yeah, I've been to, I saw him and um, his wife, uh, Megan Mullaney, mm-hmm. um, or Mullaney. Oh, I- I'm messing up her I think it's Megan Mullally. Mullally. I saw their stand-up. I mean, stand-up isn't quite right. It's They play music and yeah, tell he stories. Plays guitar and sing. Yeah, and... so it's a little bit more than just stand-up. But I have seen their show, one of their shows, um, and recommend for sure. Yeah, so it was really good. And uh, he, is, he is particularly scathing when it comes to uh, condemning right-wing politics. Mm-hmm. So if you go on any of the reviews like Audible or whatnot, you're going to see a lot of um, really angry um, alt writers that wanted to think that Nick Offerman was Ron Swanson, but he's not. He's a super liberal guy who lives in Hollywood and all of that. Well, and I think they also... Um want Ron Swanson to be something other than the character was portrayed. Um, because that's something Nick Offerman said that, that Ron Swanson is an avowed feminist. He is. And yeah, I mean, and that is, you'd never once in that show, does he ever like, um, kind of fall into that side of those stereotypes. Like he definitely is a sort of a libertarian or whatever. Yeah. Um, he's a libertarian, but he's not, like a pig well and even though he's a a libertarian um you know not to spoil a show that ended several years ago yeah um at the very end he ends up like in charge of like the national park or some or like a state park and he gives this sort of like speech to his the people that are um working with him and he says that you know it's our job to be stewards of this of this sacred land and like it's he's not a like we are going to clear cut this whole sort this whole (laughs) hillside like that's not who ron swanson was portrayed as no he was just like a meat-eating woodworking enthusiast Mm -hmm. curmudgeon yeah totally and and so yeah i really enjoyed their nick offerman content so i highly recommend anybody out there who likes uh pragmatic funny and uh sometimes charming uh-huh. uh content to go ahead and give it a check uh give it a give it your time check it out it's worth your audible credit i guarantee you that <laughs> that's so, good so uh what about you what are you into right now i don't know how we planned this but i also was going to recommend an audible book awesome uh, um do they sponsor podcasts i think i think they do actually i've listened <laughs> to podcasts where audible is the sponsor and i've been a subscriber for years yeah we both are Audible listeners, and that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of sponsor I could get behind. Where it's like it's something I'm... I already use their products. Mm-hmm. It's like if Subaru wanted to sponsor me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have two of them. I drive Subarus. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so the Audible book that I was going to recommend is "Once Upon a Time in Hollywood" uh, by Quentin Tarantino. Oh, so this was, uh, of course, a film that came out uh, a couple years ago that I was a fan of. And Tarantino has written a novel, um, not exactly an adaption of the movie. Um, It's sort of a a reinterpretation or a rethinking of the story. I guess that's his words. It's a complete rethinking of the entire story. Mm -hmm. Not that it contradicts the movie, but it elaborates on things that the movie doesn't cover. And it prioritizes different parts of the story. Um, but it enriches the film, I think, because I've rewatched the film since uh, finishing the book. And you have a lot more background context for stuff that's just like visual elements of the film. Um, and the audiobook is uh, narrated by Jennifer Jason Lee, And I really enjoyed it. So that was uh, that was going to be my only recommendation. But you did, too. So I'm going to do, too. Was it two? I call it 1.5. 1.5. <laughs> 1.5. So the other one that... I considered uh, recommending, and then I wasn't going to because I think this book was sort of a bummer. Oh, um, but I'm going to anyway now because it was wor- it's worth it. Uh, True Believer: The Rise and Fall of Stan Lee. Oh, and 
I know the the stories of like the early days of Marvel Comics pretty well. This is like my I don't know fourth or fifth book that I've uh, read or listened to about that time period. Mm-hmm. This is definitely the most critical, the most scathing of Stanley out of any of them. Um, it's a hit piece. Like it does not paint him in a good light, and it is a, a bummer of a book. But I don't think. I think the book is unfair, but I don't think it's unfactual, really, at any point. Uh, how is it unfair? Um, because I just don't... Th- I think it is so fixated on the negative um, that it doesn't really uh, make him a fully complete person. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, no one is just their their shittiest behaviors. And this book would have you kind of judge him by the his character failings. Which are plentiful. Okay. I mean, I'm not sure this is something that I would listen to, but mm-hmm. I, I am kind of interested on, in what was terrible about Stan Lee because everyone seems to love him. Yeah. And he's all too happy to, uh, to bask in the, in the sunlight of people's adoration mm-hmm. at the expense of people that he could not have done it without. And um, and at the expense of giving fair credit to his collaborators that arguably did more work than he did. Sure. Th- and th- that's true in a lot of c- scenarios where uh, creativity is not attributed to proper people. Mm-hmm. And uh, over the years, uh, there's probably a lot of opportunities to kind of do the right thing and uplift uh, people. And he just did not always stand up for his uh, his collaborators or arguably never did huh um that's that's interesting you know like uh steve gitko who's the co-creator of spider-man they both died like within a week of each other and stan lee lived in a mansion next to um leonardo dicaprio in the hollywood hills and steve ditko lived in a studio apartment in like a tenement building in or in uh, Manhattan that, wow. that he'd lived in for years for one of the biggest superheroes of all time. Yeah. So that's really the the crux of what this book is built on. Okay. Well, that's that sounds like a true bummer. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm here to I'm here to <laughs> bum you out. I <laughs> uh, want to give him the call to action. Yeah, go ahead and subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher and rate us generously. A five-star review costs you nothing, but means everything to us. You can find us on all social media platforms across the metaverse as Deep Dive the Meta. We are on Twitter, which is Dave Preferred. We're on uh, Instagram, which I like, but we're also on Pinterest, which no one likes. I'm changing teams. I'm on Team Instagram now. Oh, we're both on Instagram? Um, We're also on Vero, uh, which I use, but no one else does. Just me and Zack Snyder. I don't even know what a Vero is. (laughs) Well, I guess this is really goodbye. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey.